Well, welcome everybody to the latest Ethics in AI Colloquium. Um, my name is John Tasulis. I'm the director of the Institute for Ethics in AI here at Oxford. And the slightly paradoxical title of today's colloquium is Don't Let's Talk About AI. And it's based on a paper written by our two main speakers, which I think constitutes quite a profound challenge to some of the ideological underpinnings of what our co-authors call the actually existing AI system. So let me begin by introducing them. First, Dr. Glenn Weil, who serves as at Microsoft's Office of the Chief Technology Officer, political economist and social technologist. Octopest, which sounds a bit like a villain from a Spider-Man comic, although I think, Glenn, you did say at one point your ideological vibe was Marvel Universe meets the Communist Manifesto, so fits right into that. Uh, Glenn is the founder and chair of the Radical Exchange Foundation, a nonprofit that coordinates a global social movement for social technology. He was previously assistant professor of economics and law at the University of Chicago, and he's the co-author of the book, Radical Markets, Uprooting Capitalism and Democracy for a Just Society. He's also the author of one of my favorite pieces in the whole space of thinking about AI, which is why I'm not a technocrat. Our second main speaker is Divya Siddharth. She is an affiliate of the Radical Exchange Foundation and the Digital Society Lab and associate political economist and social technologist at Microsoft. Her research, issue, uh, her research covers issues in democratized technology, decentralized governance, and online and offline collective participation processes. And she is the author of one of the most fascinating um, reports I've read in recent times, which is entitled Taiwan Grassroots Digital Democracy That Works, which examines the quite incredible experiment in digital democracy being spearheaded by Audrey Tang, um, Taiwan's digital minister. So welcome to you, Glenn and Divya. And let me now also introduce our distinguished commentator, the Right Reverend Dr. Stephen Croft, who is the Bishop of Oxford. He has been a member of the House of Lords Select Committee on AI, which produced the report, AI in the UK, Ready, Willing and Able. So we're going to proceed with, I think, Divya giving us a 20 minute outline of the paper that she has co-authored with Glenn and a number of other authors, I understand. And then we will have Steve offer his response. We will have some give and take between the speakers and our commentator. And we will also have an opportunity for questions from everyone listening in. So please use the chat function on YouTube to ask your questions. But now I'm going to turn over to Divya to give us the main presentation. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just aiming to share my screen here. Have I succeeded? Can you see my screen? <laughs> Amazing. Um, well, thank you so much, John Bishop Croft. So delighted to be here. I'll kick off just with sharing an overview, as you mentioned, of this joint work. Want to acknowledge our incredible collaborators, Kate Crawford, Daron Asimoglu, Stephanie Dick, and, and many others. I'll aim as much as possible here to cover the breadth of our project, but I know that Glenn will fill in the richness and color that I've missed in this discussion beyond my introductory comments. And to the audience, as we said, the work is, um, you know, our project is inherently collective and we would welcome your thoughts and participation today and as we take it forward. So as you called out, we've been calling this project, Don't Let's Talk About AI. And that's come from a question we pose to ourselves and we'll pose to you today, is the focus on AI a fundamental wrong turn in the future of technology? We aren't by any means the first to question whether AI might have negative impacts in 2019. I think the World Economic Forum documented about 300 proposals for ethics and guidelines and principles aiming at governing AI and, and mitigating potential harms. And of course, here we are at the Ethics in AI Colloquium at Oxford, and it's such an honor to be here. And in some sense, we're participating in, in the epitome of this AI ethics debate, right? And it's our question that, is this cutting to the core of what we need to be addressing, or is it, is it reinforcing rather than transcending some of these harms through the frame of AI? 
So I'll go ahead here and lay out our argument that the dominant vision of AI, which operates more as an ideology than a set of technologies or research directions is fundamentally misdirected in goals and dangerous in effects. But before we get into that, I think it's important to say upfront, our response to these flaws must be in proposing and building towards alternate directions that do create shared prosperity and flourishing. We are not trapped on this path. And the solution is not to slow down technical progress or innovation, but to redirect it. If anything, this hold of AI ideology keeps us from real technological progress and innovation, from seeing the potential of so many alternate paths. And in this paper, we bring in evidence from you know, economics and social science and psychology and philosophy, et cetera, to make this argument. But really, we don't even need to look that far. The history of digital technology itself, from when Norman Wieners, the human use of human beings, offered alternate paths to the Turing test um, before McCarthy had even coined the term AI, you know, called out the issues with narrow conceptions of intelligence, to the many augmentative approaches we see now, from alien intelligence to participatory design, the digital commons, decentralized tech, data collaboratives, there's such a flowering of possibilities. So that's just a quick roadmap of where we're going. But before I get ahead of myself, getting excited about all of these possibilities, um, want to sort of lay the foundation of that argument. So we take this, this idea of an AI ideology and we capture it under the term, as John mentioned, actually existing AI, a nod to the classic distinction between actually existing socialism, actually existing capitalism, and the sort of respective ideals of these systems. And one interesting thing off the bat is that because the investments and practices of the AI ecosystem are so speculative, um, and, and often so oriented by, by a vision of the future, this essentially also captures the idea of actually imagined, actually envisioned um, AI, which we bucket under this. So we three, see three major pieces to this vision. Um, the first, it, we, we take as our target some of the, the major well-funded AI labs as, as a crystallization of this, although it crops up in a lot of different forms. And so the first piece um, of this vision is human competition, this target of achieving general intelligence defined by Comparison to with the aim of surpassing some concept of generalized human level capabilities. One lab open AI discusses this as outperforming humans at most economically valuable work, but there's a range of formulations um, that, that generally capture this aspiration to reaching and then exceeding human intelligence. The second is autonomy. So targeting the ind independence of these systems to a large extent um, from human direction and agency. This is again clear in, in several of these formulations. Working off of a notion of intelligence is a general and abstract quality equally applicable to many problems. And the third is centralization. So that is the centralization of massive resources and decision-making power at the direction of a small group. To us, this is an implication of the first two rather than a core element of stated goals, although sometimes it is stated. Um, it's worth diving into why this is the case. You know, Why do we see this implication? Essentially, if you're committed to a highly ambitious goal like building general human level intelligence, and you see that goal as, as an overriding priority, a blocker to solving a range of other problems, you know, solving intelligence allows you to solve everything else. And you're committed to the false notion of that being possible autonomously, of building these autonomous intelligent systems, we see a couple of things. First, minimizing human input becomes obviously a crucial piece of success. Um, it's not, it, you can't say you've solved this until you have minimized human input. And second, the, most, the more capital that can be concentrated in the machine, the more resources, the more powerful and potentially human surpassing it is. So of course you can solve highly ambitious goals in a distributed and democratized way. We'll soon get to our proposed range of alternatives to this vision and they all center around this. But this combination of the first two pillars in practice, we say leads to this third piece, which is centralization. So what are the issues across these three pieces? Well, first, surpassing human intelligence. This sets the relationship between humans and machines as one of competition, not cooperation and augmentation. The aim for absolute advantage over humans rather than playing to comparative advantages foregoes the possibility of augmenting the collective intelligence of a broader human machine system. The second is autonomy. Obviously, I say obviously, clearly not obviously, intelligence is fundamentally social. What we deem as intelligent is contingent and co-created via culture, surroundings, network, and interactions. There's little support in any field for intelligence as the type of homogenous and universally applicable quality that this aspiration towards general autonomous systems would require. A bunch of work bears this out. Psychology, John Dewey is a great example here. Organizational studies, you know, the intelligence of groups is determined by their ability to communicate and collaborate, not by individual intelligence. 
swaths of economics that focus on how value production involves complementarities uh, across workers and systems. And also technology built with this autonomous conception of intelligence is particularly subject to Goodhart's law type issues, that idea of optimizing quantitative systems to over optimize what they measure and lead to massive failures, despite avoiding these issues being one of the primary goals of a lot of AI safety research. And finally, many systems that we currently see as autonomous, discuss as autonomous, are actually built on significant either underpaid or unaware human labor, from exploitative data labor um, to building large scale models out of public human generated language corpuses um, under things like Creative Commons. But neither of these misdirected you know, premises of autonomy nor the poor target of general human intelligence are really enough to make actually existing AI a dangerous project. Why are we here, right? Why are we concerned about this? It's only when taken together with the third piece, centralization, that we see this as a real concern. So I mentioned the theoretical precepts of the centralization pillar earlier, but let's bring this down to earth a bit. First, capital in our society, obviously owned in a far more concentrated way than labor, removing humans from the equation and focusing on the autonomous productive power of capital necessarily accrues value to a smaller and smaller group. Um, for example, Microsoft, which for the record employs us, um, recently invested a billion dollars into OpenAI, which has a staff of, I think, around 120 employees. So this is comparable in ratio to the Soviet investment in 1975 of employees of the state planning agency and, and with similar kind of centralizing aims. Secondly, and relatedly, building for powerful autonomous systems doesn't just concentrate economic resources, it centralizes decision-making agency and choices about values and trade-offs within the machine and by extension, within the tiny and homogenous group of technologists, engineers, and researchers that build those systems. Not to mention you know, uh, the implications of the well-known issues of diversity and race, gender, geography, and social classes, many thinkers in the AI ethics space have done the important work of calling out. So this is centralization at, at many levels. And I would say there's rhetoric in the actually existing AI space around using these resultant highly centralized AIs beneficially, you know, solve intelligence and then trust us to make sure that we use it to solve everything else. And um, we'd like to say that this is destined to fail. Proposals for extreme concentration in the direction of productive resources is not new, nor is the idea that such a centralized system could be technocratically designed for the greater good. History is littered with examples of the failures of this model Giant cities no one wants, as happened with Brasilia, mass starvation due to miscalculations of crop yields. John, you brought up Glenn's great why well, I, I am not a technocrat piece that just expounds on, on this theme extensively if folks are interested in reading that. Uh, in my experience, the so-called you know, development space is a treasure trove of similar stories, top-down programs trying to redesign how people live, work, and learn driven by technology, designed in you know, elite Western institutions with basically no input from groups that were supposedly intended to benefit, who also rarely had the chance to opt out. And there's been a string of incredibly well-funded failures, uh, one laptop per child, universal internet programs, highly recommend Geek Heresy by Kentaro Toyoma as a diagnosis of this issue and better directions to take. I was actually a research fellow for two years in the lab that he describes and, and set up in Bangalore, implementing a range of the participatory design approaches, thinking about decolonial technology um, that we'll discuss later in alternative paths with broad responses to these real repeated and, and material failures of this type of centralized model in development. And one of the major things to take away here is this, new forms of technocracy and centralization are consistently proposed to solve the problems and limitations of previous forms. Um, for example, a group of technocrats from Harvard essentially redesigned the economies of post-Soviet Eastern Europe, supposed intent of correcting for the brittleness of Soviet central planning machines, and yet in creating and aiming for this supposedly decentralized free market system, they made thousands of top-down choices on how to architect and regulate these markets with minimal participation or input, again, from the citizens of those countries, minimal accountability, no responsive mechanisms that we're advocating for leading to the extreme inequality, monopolization by oligarchs, and eventually collapse of many of these economies. And so, you know, in trying to solve um, one of the failures of technocracy and centralization with another, they just resulted in similar failures. Tiny homogenous groups architecting centralizing systems, no matter how benevolent the intentions have consistently led to these kinds of disastrous outcomes. So, you know, we've outlined uh, some fairly theoretical reasons for our concerns about AI. Very briefly, because I want to get to the, the discussion of alternate approaches, 
do we see the results and negative consequences we'd expect from these systems that we've laid out, you know, flawed, unproductive, brittle? And in short, yes. Um, as it stands, the age of AI has coincided with a stagnation in productivity, a rise in inequality, dramatic concentration in the gains from economic growth towards capital and away from labor. Among the companies with the lowest share of in labor share of income are the tech giants that we've already spoken about. Um, their heavy reliance on autonomous optimization protocols over human judgment, while often highlighted as early successes of AI, are increasingly seen as responsible for driving today's polarized and low trust political environment, eroding the information ecosystem, re-entrenching racial and gender divides through biased algorithms, increasing the precarity of work in different ways, and resulting in the inescapable of inescapability of surveillance capitalism across more and more spheres of life. And, and we could dive into any of these at length, but I think they've been really well covered and theorized by the far richer work of many others. And perhaps more profoundly, We've seen um, you know, a deep social or even spiritual crisis brewing here. And, and Bishop Croft, I hope we can speak more about this through the conversation. We ask ourselves, you know, what does it mean to aim to build systems that we intend to cede more and more resources and control to? We could pull out hard data on de decreasing trust um, in technology and institutions broadly. There are some shocking numbers of declines uh, in the recent Edelman Trust Barometer. But this may be beyond something really measurable in that sense. You know, my background, as I mentioned, in qualitative research it is in qualitative research. And just in the course of traveling and talking to people, there's this deep concern evident, a loss of uh, a sense of loss of self-government, freedom, agency, material stability, resources, uh, and the ability for people in their communities to really be masters of their own faith. And this might spill over sometimes into fundamentalism, extremism, conspiracy theories, but it's a growing and increasingly documented feeling and it's shared across standard political and social divides. There's no opting out of this world the technical elites have designed and the loss of agency it often entails and the profound implications of its power on our economic and social realities. Now, we don't mean to lay the ills of society at the feet of AI, right? This is obviously happening in conjunction with a range of other trends, um, not least the, the neoliberal focus on economic relationships and increasing privatization. Um, but we can see how this AI ideology is implicated across a range of economic and political crises. So these are the stakes here to us. And so finally, you know, we've talked through the problems with this vision, but criticism, as we all know, is, is cheap. So where do we go from here? And I hope the main takeaway from our conversation is that we are not trapped on this path of AI realism. There are alternatives and they don't look like one prescribed path or a different single ambitious goal to aim for. The alternative is really a range of complementary approaches that build on and reinforce each other, what we will refer to under the name digital pluralism. And as I mentioned earlier, we don't have to look very far for the seeds of this. Concerns about AI as a, as a direction for the future of technology have been around in the space longer than the term artificial intelligence itself. We could spend hours on an in-depth history of this. And if you're curious, highly recommend John Markoff's The Machines of Loving Grace for that in-depth history. Um, for our purposes, it's not too much of a stretch to say that many of the most widely used and admired technologies that serve human needs today, the internet, personal computers, virtual reality, wikis, rose explicitly from an attempt to chart a path that's different from this notion of AI. And what has really resulted is a plurality of alternatives, which break with the three pillars of the actually existing AI vision to different degrees. So there's work that breaks with the focus on imitating human intelligence, for example, the paradigm of alien intelligence by James Evans and collaborators, um, various ways that aim to develop intelligence is unrelated um, and, and different from human intelligence. There's projects like AlphaFold from DeepMind um, that deliberately target areas of comparative human disadvantage. There's work on optimizing metrics of human complementarity. There's Eric Drexler's vision of an AI services model, the idea of narrow AI that solves specific problems, all of which we welcome and is, and is encouraging. Similarly, there's a second category that takes the beyond human intelligence goal of AI, but breaks with the focus on autonomously achieving this goal. So here we'd put you know, data collaboratives enabled by new economic and legal designs, as well as a range of privacy preserving machine learning approaches fit here, as does work on legibility and transparency, cooperative AI, human in the loop systems and things like that. Um, and there's, there's some attempts at addressing centralization without targeting, uh, we would say, many of the other pillars. So under this category, we put 
AI governance, standard AI fairness and transparency issues, post hoc redistribution calls like the windfall clause approach, et cetera. And while this is all important and valuable work, um, especially if AI remains and grows as a power center, we do find that sometimes work in this area is used to legitimate AI more broadly or make it appear to be a field you know, pursuing its goals in this ethical and socially desirable manner, which we argue cannot be the case given the fundamental centralizing tendency. So we see a range of approaches that target one or another of these pillars that, that don't maybe strike at the heart, but that we still find promising and encouraging. And then there's, there's approaches that break much more deeply with the AI paradigm that decenter the role of technology and technologists and that center communities and truly responsive socio-technical systems that can facilitate collective intelligence. And, and honestly, this is super exciting to me. I find it quite beautiful to think about where this flowering of approaches may take us. So one piece of this we could say is human-centered design and related approaches, which aim to really understand human needs and limitations and to build systems engineered to effectively communicate with humans, fulfill their needs and allow for flexible use and compensate for limitations. Non-coincidentally, Terry Winograd, one of the founders of the field, specifically wanted to create a humanistic and, and semiotic counterweight to the rationalist focus of AI. There has been a lot of work building on human-centered design and expanding it and, and correcting for its flaws. So participatory and collaborative design processes expand these tenets into uh, you know, processes that involve stakeholders in the design process, utilize deliberative and constructive tools to really make sure that people are, are have agency in the, the things that are designed to serve them. Decolonial technologies uh, build tech to distribute power and voice and are grounded in historical analyses of post-colonial power relationships that shape our technical priorities, politics, and infrastructure. So even this flowering in the, the participatory and human-centered design space shows us how these approaches can build on each other and compensate for limitations in others when taken together. And then we have the social technology agenda, which itself expands on work in deliberative and democratic technology that uses social science to design new political and economic institutions enabled by digital technology. We would say, um, closely related work on web three and decentralized tech, uh, you know, building from work in the blockchain, aiming to augment and construct new protocols that allow for peer to peer information transfer, emergent governance systems, new ways of thinking about identity, sovereignty and transactions uh, and, and social interaction. And then there's digital commons approaches that advocate for public infrastructure based cutting edge tech, polycentric, multi-stakeholder governance and development structures ac across local, regional, and global levels. So this takes inspiration from the Australian approach to governing the commons um, that many others are carrying forward. And many specific technologies that we really admire, Wikipedia, deliberative tech, um, we work with a group called Polis uh, that I think spoke at Oxford recently, successful examples of community-oriented tech for development like 99 Dots, smart contracts and, and decentralized autonomous organizations enabling cooperative action, data collaboratives, open source technologies, um, broadly internet infrastructure, work on decentralized identity, really take multiple of the above approaches and combine them. And to me, and John mentioned a, a piece I read on this earlier, one shining example that can illustrate all of this together is the amazing work of digital minister Audrey Tong, who has both collaborated on and inspired much of this writing. So uh, in partnership with Audrey, Taiwan has rolled out incredible experiments in collective intelligence and the, really the kind of grounded collective intelligence that we think these approaches can lead to through digital democracy, decentralized governance and community hacking in which more than half of the country's 24 million citizens have participated. This has resulted in Taiwan's best in the world COVID response data coalitions to fight climate change that allow citizens to participate in and benefit from their own data lightning fast combating of digital misinformation through tech enabled uh, human networks of fact checkers and a suite of open source technical solutions for collective legislating on everything from transportation policy to technology regulation. And to me, you know, that's basically a list of many of the major problems that we're facing today. The kinds of problems that one could and people have said need centralized top down tech first approaches to solve, solve intelligence, you know, use it to solve everything else. And, Yet what worked instead is these deeply participative, collaborative, socio-technical systems. I won't go too much into depth here, uh, and, and I would highly recommend looking up Audrey's work, but to me this recently, this really shows us what's possible when we wholeheartedly embrace digital pluralism as an ecosystem approach. And that's 
really the core of the difference between actually existing AI and digital pluralism. AI takes intelligence as a single autonomous quality to be both reached for and feared, you know, one that can only be accept, accessed and stewarded by a chosen few. In contrast to this almost eschatological vision, digital pluralism is ecological in nature. We acknowledge intelligence as this complex emergent outgrowth of a variety of systems interacting at a range of levels, realizing that progress is not about getting to a single uh, and obtainable truth via objective rationality. Progress is in a variety of different perspectives, branching and differentiating out, creating new ways to fulfill human and ecological needs, distributing material ownership and decision-making, and surprising and inspiring further collective creativity and complexity. Uh, while some in the AI space may consider superintelligence to be this natural evolutionary step from human intelligence, we contend that this ecological branching and complex interplay of intelligent systems is far closer to true evolutionary progress. And with that, I'll conclude with a poem that Audrey put forth, uh, put forth as her job description that I think captures all of this better than I can. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about the human experience. And when we hear the singularity is near, let us remember the plurality is here. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Divya. That was a really excellent uh, and very clear presentation of a very rich and complex paper. I really appreciate that. And I'm going to now pass over to uh, Bishop Stephen, okay. who will give us a response to some of the themes that you've brought forward. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, Divya and Glenn, uh, for the paper, which I've enjoyed reading and engaging with. And enjoyed even more, Divya, hearing you uh, expound and uh, my kind of, uh, it set off lots of new thoughts as I listened to you uh, this afternoon, really. I think it's a really uh, excellent, helpful, uh, benchmarking uh, paper, uh, uh, offering a really coherent uh, analysis. Uh, and it really, I, I think, um, particularly as I listened to you this afternoon, uh, begins to operate at the level of myth and story and the rationale for the way things are, particularly in the way you pull apart uh, the two myths of actually existing AI and digital pluralism and contrast them and demonstrate what, uh, what is flowing from them. Um, I, it, it actually tells the story of my own journey with all of this stuff, and here is my disclaimer that I'm not an expert at all in the technical aspects of AI. Um, uh, I am, uh, I've spent my lifetime in Anglican ministry as a vicar and trainer of clergy and uh, latterly as a bishop, I serve and lead a community of a thousand churches, chaplains and schools across three counties uh, in England. Um, uh, but as part of that, I get to engage with the UK parliament through a seat in the House of Lords and as part of that, began to engage four years ago in public policy around AI and have been immersed in it uh, uh, really uh, since then. It's been fascinating. But at the start of my journey, what kept me awake at night, and it did, uh, was reading books about uh, artificial general intelligence, what you've called actually existing AI and the cautionary terms. And my symbol for what was happening was the symbol everybody uses of the Terminator robot or something of that kind. Uh, and then the more I read, the more what kept me awake changed from uh, artificial general intelligence to the way narrow AI was being used now. Uh, and my symbol changed from a robotic figure uh, to a store loyalty card, uh, uh, a symbol of the collection and use of data, often beyond the understanding of the people uh, they were, uh, uh, whose data was being collected. So I really recognize the debate. Uh, I think in, the, in, in terms of where we are in the UK in the public policy world, the focus has already shifted uh, to where you're inviting us to go, which is, concern and reflection on the collaborative use of 
these technologies uh, uh, alongside human intelligence and agency. So within a UK context, I think uh, um, the popular discourse and press understanding has become much more sophisticated. When I sat on the House of Lords Committee on AI, we had a, a, a whole session on communications. And I remember the lead BBC journalist saying in that session uh, that every story about AI submitted to a newspaper, the picture editor was going to put a picture of a, a Terminator robot, a killer robot alongside it, because that was what the term meant in popular imagination. That's no longer the case. There was a story, uh, and actually, I think the readership has become much more sophisticated over the last year. There's been a 54% increase in the number of stories featuring AI in Britain over the last year. Uh, and the story I, I read the other day about the use of AI to support heart surgery in stents had sensible pictures of doctors and operating theatres and, and technical diagrams. It was very much in the collaborative domain. Um, the Centre for Data Ethics uh, AI Barometer, which was published in June last year, explores the future and maps the future through looking at five different sectors. Uh, and it's all about the present application of these technologies in the narrow sense and the widespread and urgent need of ethics and governance. Uh, and the, the approach to that governance, which is developing in the UK, uh, is absolutely uh, along those lines. And, and in general terms, the UK is taking a vertical approach to policy and governance, not trying to uh, legislate generally for something called artificial intelligence applied across a whole range of different sectors, but legislating in particular sectors uh, and looking for continuity between the values of society and the new technologies. So, so very much in line with what you're saying. I think there's an interesting contrast emerging between the UK government and the European Union, uh, which has just published uh, a new proposal for AI regulation that takes an extremely broad approach to AI uh, techniques and approaches, including statistical approach approaches, it, but it groups them all together and really is attempting to legislate and regulate horizontally rather than vertically, which I think will prove to be a contrasting approach. Um, you invited me kindly to reflect on the social and spiritual dimensions of your inquiry. Uh, and I think that's a really stimulating question. Uh, uh, as I uh, look at that field, I think the science fiction debates around uh, uh, these technologies are developing in the opposite direction to the public policy debate, much more in line uh, with your actually existing AI and the myths uh, around that. Uh, as a most recent example, which I think is a really beautiful narrative, Clara and the Sun by Kashua Ishiguro, uh, has at the centre uh, um, uh, of its uh, narrative uh, a wonderful exploration of what it means to be human and turns around a, a fundamental question uh, where uh, the lead character, Clara, uh, an artificial friend, uh, is asked by uh, uh, one of the other human characters, do you believe in the human heart? Uh, something that makes a special an individual the deepest part of us vast and complex rooms within rooms. Uh, and uh, what does it mean uh, to be a human person? I think one of the attractions of the myth you've explored of actually existing AI, both in the present and in the future, is the endless attraction of a mirror and a reflection of what it means to be human uh, and a dive into that. And what we see reflected in the science fiction and in some of the projections uh, of the technology around actually existing AI uh, are a multiplicity of projections, uh, both true and false, uh, uh, flowing from that. Uh, and I think the centralization uh, and the attraction of centralization is a fundamental part of that. I think there's a bolstering of our pride both as creators of extraordinary machines, even new life forms, uh, which I think rests on a 
a falsehood. Uh, I think there's a screen created which, uh, on which we project our own dreams and visions of the future, and especially the overcoming of our mortality. Uh, uh, it reinforces the paradox of being human uh, or distorts it, uh, but the paradox will always be there, which is amazement and wonder combined with frailty and mortality. And I think the centra centralization, which you've drawn out so well this afternoon, is symptomatic uh, of uh, that projection. And it's, it's very interesting to me in the light of what you said, that all of these science fiction explorations are dystopian, not utopian. Uh, that the, the disaster of centralization is highlighted in, in the fiction. So I really warm to your language of digital pluralism. And I just, uh, as a final uh, uh, brief comment, would just um, uh, uh, submit for your reflection uh, an exploration of the concept of agency uh, in the midst of what you're doing. Intelligence is a very broad and general category. It's hard to pin down. It's not an equivalent to human beings. We have not created anything like the wonder uh, of real human intelligence. But we are needing in a number of different fields to distinguish between capability and agency as particularly machines make decisions and take actions uh, which are collaborative and we will need to distinguish between uh, automated agency and human agency and my colleague Simon Cross is developing very interesting ideas uh, around that to, to explore whether it's possible to develop a, a quotient of automated agency and human agency in, in both of those things combined. Uh, but really interesting paper. Thank you so much. Look forward very much to the discussion and conversation and interaction. Thank you so much, Stephen. So Stephen raises three broad issues um, for our authors. One, you're preaching to the converted, at least so far as the UK is concerned. We're already with you. Second, um, science fiction as a basis for meditating on the spiritual deficits of actually existing AI. And thirdly, whether the notion of agency rather than intelligence is a more instructive uh, point of um, focus. So Divya, Glenn, who would like to take up any of those themes? Divya, perhaps I can speak to the first and then you can take the next two or pass it back to me as you like. I'm happy to have you start and then we'll go. So uh, on the issue of um, public policy, uh, I think it's quite schizophrenic. Um, and I think governments uh, and populations are not unitary, they're diverse. And while I think that there is quite a lot of truth in the regulatory space on what you said, Stephen, I actually don't think the regulatory space is even close to the most influential part of what the government does. I actually think the most influential thing the government does is fund research. And uh, in particular, the military of governments funds research. And um, the, the restraints that can be placed by the regulatory environment often pale both in speed and uh, impetus to the force that is given by the research funding uh, function of governments. Um, and uh, there's, a very well um, versed history of this in the United States. And in fact, you can trace 20 years in advance the terms that become the central ones in the technologies of the Western world to what ARPA was funding at the time in the United States. So during the 1960s, ARPA funded human complementing uh, distributed technologies that developed into the internet. Um, in the 1980s, uh, under the Reagan administration, the US funded artificial intelligence uh, systems uh, aimed at achieving fast and autonomous reaction to Soviet threats, uh, which were basically different visions that had been debating. And uh, 20 years later, you saw the dominant uh, discourse in the world of technology following what had been funded by those militaries. Today, the military funding is overwhelmingly, and there's tons of evidence about this, flowing towards precisely the vision that the regulatory state is rejecting. And whatever the regulatory state says 
it is going to be very hard to keep up with where venture capital and military funding and to a lesser extent civil uh, funding of research is going. There simply are not the resources flowing into developing civic technologies, human augmentative technologies, et cetera. It's just orders of magnitude separated. Um, so until we address that these orders of magnitude difference in the allocation of capital, I do not think that any regulatory regime that comes that, that does anything short of simply prohibiting the military and the venture capital markets from funding various things is going to have a material impact on the direction of technological progress. It can along the edges constrain the technical technological progress that we do make, which in my view is only likely to sort of further impair our ability to compete with authoritarian systems that are fully harnessing things like that. But it's not actually gonna offer an alternative direction for technology to flow in. And I think that brings us to the second point on, on science fiction and its relevance or irrelevance. Um, personally, I think science fiction has all sorts of problems, but ultimately can only be answered with other science fiction because the reality is that the science fiction that we read is, you know, and that are read by relevant people in positions of power, as well as by communities in the position to challenge that power are what determine the directions we will take things. You know, in 1968, J.C.R. Licklider wrote the Intergalactic Computer Network, which became, uh, you know, basically the foundation for what uh, was the internet. That was, I believe, three years after Star Trek debuted. It's quite hard for me to imagine that the terminology he used in that paper would have existed absent the, uh, you know, United Federation of Planets. Um, and I think in, in, therefore in many ways, Star Trek is probably responsible for the best, in, in many ways, the best parts of uh, the technological landscape that we developed. But of course, then Terminator came along and, 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 and you know, the resultant effects on the Reagan administration and so forth. So I think we cannot avoid imagining tomorrow because the tomorrow that we imagine is the tomorrow that with our best or worst intentions we'll end up building. Um, Divya, do you want to turn to the question about agency? Yeah, I think, um, you know, adding on to the science fiction piece, you mentioned why is it that we're moving towards dystopian and rather uh, versus utopian kind of science fiction universes, right? And I think there's a lot of beautiful writing on this. Actually, Ted Chang has a, a great piece kind of looking at some of this. But overall, as we see some of the issues that we've pointed out, spiritual crises, loss of agency, fear, um, you know, major overpowering centralized uh, systems and, and concentrations of power, making people feel like when we have a major crisis, as we're seeing with COVID, as we uh, are seeing with climate change, that we don't, we don't have the ability to solve it, right? And I think all of those failures often come from failures of institutions, of social systems, um, of priorities. Uh, clearly in the U.S., Glenn and I both worked actually on a sprint on COVID policy in the U.S. and really, really saw the way that it's a question of priorities, uh, not a question of developing technology fast enough. It's a question of building socio-technical systems. And I think that's why the Taiwan example is so beautiful because it points away, obviously it's not a utopia, but what, what utopic thinking could look like that actually functions the way that many of our other systems don't. Um, and I think in terms of uh, reconstituting intelligence uh, as agency or, or shifting our view from intelligence to agency, I think we're very much in agreement that intelligence as this, this narrowly defined and yet somehow general homogenous quantity applicable to many problems is not a good way of, of benchmarking systems or thinking about what we're trying to build. So in that sense, um, I think it's, it's good to shift from that perspective. It's my view that we will likely not find another perfect kind of substitute for intelligence and, and rather uh, we'll need to look at augmenting the capacity of broader systems uh, and complementary approaches. But I think, you know, agency can be a big part of what that means to empower. Stephen, is there anything you'd like to say in response before we go more broadly? Yeah, just just briefly. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Both really uh, helpful responses. And, and I think the point about um, the, uh, the arms race and investment is is really helpful, and I I, um, 
just as I was thinking about this afternoon and saying about my journey from away from the Terminator robot, I got an email in my inbox, UK campaign to stop killer robots. Uh, and actually it's about an, e an email about legal autonomous weapon systems and, and research. I, I didn't get that as clearly from your paper and presentation that that kind of disproportion uh, of investment. And, it, and it's, I think for me, it's a very powerful uh, set of arguments. Uh, I, I think the, um, the, there is, I think, I, I accept what both of you have said there, and, and I think it's very helpful, but I think there is a contrasting danger uh, um, the, uh, of, of projecting all the kind of bad and evils in the world on, on one kind of misuse of technology or, or pursuit of it. I, I think there are many reasons in every generation for why things go wrong in human society and culture. I think it's great to stop a trend in a wrong direction, which is what I see you're doing. Uh, but it, but it, the, the journey to utopia won't even be through through the, the more dispersed model, as I'm sure you recognize. But, but I think what the center um, uh, that John is director of is so encouraging in is the bringing together of the sciences and the humanities. Uh, because I think it's in those dialogues and the humanizing of the technological discourse and the building confidence in science uh, from the arts perspective, which is so hugely important as, as things move forward. But thank you. So as we wait for some questions, um, I'm going to ask um, a question myself. Look, I thought this was an incredibly rich paper, incredibly thought provoking. One of the most bold moves you make is the claim that actually existing AI is an inherently technocratic project, right? inherently so. So you don't like to use the word artificial general intelligence, but you talk about a project aimed at developing a form of artificial intelligence that um, equals and outstrips eventually human intelligence and that exhibits a significant kind of autonomy. And then you say, for, from those technological aspirations, a necessary concomitant is the vast centralization of power. So that's where I got a little bit lost because I think that sounds, it kind of sounds plausible and it's quite frightening because technocracy is frightening. A lot of people think that technocracy is a cure for all the nasty exclusionary aspects of um, populism. But another way of looking at it is that it's populism's alter ego. And you get, and what they have in common is that they're both fundamentally anti-democratic. And what I see you putting forward in this paper, in your digital pluralism, is a more democratized form of, of approach to, to society and to technology. But my question was, why must, for want of a better word, this uh, project of artificial general intelligence necessarily assume a technocratic form, even though maybe, in fact, right now it does? So, here are two thoughts, and you know it's a bit bad referring to your paper because I'm conscious of the fact that um, uh, our audience has not had the benefit of reading this fantastic paper. But one thing you say at one point is, um, to preserve the myth of autonomy, um, as few people as possible must be involved in building the machine. But that's a kind of PR thing, isn't it? That's a kind of um, ideological window dressing. It's not strictly speaking necessary. It's just a way of selling the message. Meanwhile, another thing you say, which maybe cuts against the claim about technocracy, is you say, look, the kind of artificial intelligence that's being built will necessarily fail because you say um, it's designed by a small, narrow group. And this small, narrow group is unable to formalize the rich diversity of data that you would need to genuinely have the kind of intelligence they're trying to create. But that's circular, isn't it? Because the point was a artificial general intelligence must lead to a technocratic response, but now we're assuming that it's already the product of a technocratic response. So one thought might be, well, one of the ways to get that rich data into the design is by democratizing. So I'm not advocating this, but I just see it as a logical possibility. Someone saying, I'm a Democrat, I don't believe in technocracy, but I still think that the project of something like artificial general intelligence is a valid one and should be pursued though in a democratic manner and will be more likely to succeed on your own telling in a democratic manner because it needs the diversity of input that a small elite could not give. 
So, so John, I think that the fundamental issue has to do with how, like we have to be clear on how we're defining artificial intelligence as a project. The, the democratized vision that you are describing simply does not have autonomous systems. Like the system that you described is not an autonomous one. It's simply not. It's one that involves people like Wikipedia. Nobody describes Wikipedia as artificial intelligence. I'm not saying that artificial intelligence couldn't be described in a bunch of different ways, but no one describes it that way. Wikipedia is an incredibly effective digital system, but everyone is aware of the variety of human agency that goes into creating it. And thus it does not achieve the mythos of autonomy. So let's, the let's, in yeah, Taiwan let's, are, are incredibly effective digital systems. No one describes them as artificial intelligence. They, they've achieved all these systems that I'm describing have achieved far more, I think almost everyone would agree than any AI application has in terms of human welfare and, and, and intelligence and capability. And like along almost any sort of genuinely beneficial dimension, I think there's not even really debate that those have achieved more than any AI system has. And yet they're not described as AI. Why not? Because they don't achieve the mythos of autonomy. But, but let, let me get back to that. So there is no implication here of creating AI without human agency. So even the elite created AI will be created by human beings. So now the question would arise, um, what difference does it make to the mythos of autonomy, whether a few create it or many create it, it's still dependent upon human creation. So therefore autonomy in this context would not be free of human creation, whether by the many or the few, Autonomy would be something about its operation. It's able to reach decisions without, in that discrete context of reaching a decision, for example, input oversight by individuals. So, so you know, you, a few, many, it's still dependent, right? Well, I, I think that I agree, but I think that the mythos is that it's not dependent. And that mythos is false. And confused. But that cuts but against it, both. It cuts against the elite and the democracy. But, I, but I, don't, I, don't, I don't think as a practical matter it does. And the reason it doesn't as a practical matter is that the more people that are involved in a system, the harder it is to maintain a mythos that falsely obscures the role of human agency in creating the thing. I think because, I, yeah. because like when there's only a few people involved, then only those people can plausibly deny the the autonomy of the system and they can choose not to as a matter of social practice and no one is you know talking to them necessarily anyways and so forth right and whereas and they're they're being very highly compensated for not breaking that you know wizard of oz like uh veil um uh whereas if you have millions of people involved and you're saying this thing is autonomous people would say it's not autonomous i did that right I think, you know, we called out practices like data collaboration as, you know, alternative paths. And to me, what you're describing does seem like that data coalitions, people come together, right? Um, answer questions through pooled data, have legal mechanisms to preserve privacy. All of this is, is work that's in progress. Privacy preserving machine learning techniques can play into that. I mean, I think this is possible. I think we, we had it under um, you know, distributed systems that still aim for human intelligence. And I think some of the, the concerns about these are not, um, are not necessarily on the autonomy piece, which I think some of them do directly and successfully target autonomy, um, but instead on, is this the most productive way forward necessarily for this huge amount of investment? And um, I think that's, that's the question worth asking, right? What, as Glenn was saying, what is the myth of autonomy doing materially in the world? Well, often it's erasing a lot of contributions. Often it's taking labor from people who were either unaware or for various reasons are exploited in that labor. Um, often it takes resources and funding away from other approaches. So that I think is, is the material consequence of what we see as the issue of autonomy here. And as we do, as the goal, if the goal is to create highly autonomous systems, and I think explicitly one of those formulations we had up there has their goal as creating highly autonomous systems. I mean, it's, it's, it's there, it's incontrovertible. Um, you know, what does that mean about how this myth is going to be perpetuated in the future? It means not only are these problems not going to be addressed, but likely to deepen because 
clearly the systems we have now are not very autonomous. The point is, is if anything, to make them much more autonomous. And I think, you know, not to not to say all of this progress is in this direction. We we called out existing projects um, that do seem to, for example, target human complementarity, like AlphaFold, but still aim for autonomy, and and the other way with data collaboratives to say you can have progress on any of these. This is to an extent, you know, a sliding scale. But if you're aiming for more autonomy and less human input, well, then that I think is centralizing. Did you want to come in on this? Well, we can't hear you though, you need to unmute. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's really, it, it, it's really interesting. I, 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 do, I do wonder whether you're underestimating from, from a, certainly from a UK perspective, the capacity of a population to adopt or not particular approaches and, and to accept or not. I mean, one of the key uh, debates and concerns in the UK is constantly to work to build public engagement, trust and confidence in the technology that's developing. Uh, and there's an, an inbuilt fear that some of the benefits of new technology won't be realized because the public trust and confidence isn't there. And we've seen that in a very focused way over the last year with engagement with uh, apps, which aim to track uh, uh, COVID uh, infection. Uh, and if, if people don't have confidence in the technology and in the way the data is used, they simply won't, won't use it and adopt it. So I, I think the population uh, is learning quickly and actually is capable of making individual decisions, not being manipulated uh, uh, overall by, by these technocrats. I think people are, are much more savvy about the use of technology than perhaps, I still agree with your thesis, but perhaps in some of your comments would indicate. So, so Stephen, I actually would strongly agree with that. And I actually think that that's precisely the problem. What we have gotten ourselves into is a cycle of technology that is designed based on these um, mixture of sinister and confused ideas and then rejection of the population of that technology together mm -hmm. resulting in the Western world being unable to compete effectively with authoritarian systems where the pop population is denied the agency to make those choices. Mm -hmm. And that is, a, that is a disastrous cycle. And, and I think both sides, both the populist rejectionists and the technocratic uh, colonizers are equally to blame for an incredibly unproductive dynamic. And the way out of it, unfortunately, can't come from either of those instincts, either the rejection or the colonization. It must come from a, a different path, which actually sees a positive democratic and participatory direction for technology. But that in turn can't come just from regulation. It has to come from funding, research and development, and focus on those alternative ways of doing it. You know, one, one just little example of this, of what's so incredibly unproductive is, you know, the Future for Humanity Institute is hosted at Oxford, and I'm sure John has interactions with them. Maybe you do as well, Stephen. And um, they have done a lot of work recently on developing ideas around AI safety. And these have come back to the notion that no, we don't want any system to be set on its path with a given goal. We want it to constantly check back in with humans to be uncertain about what it's trying to achieve, et cetera. Um, and you know, that's where we've gotten after 40 years of research in AI, which is the starting point in Wiener's 1955 you know, uh, uh, book, was that that would be necessary. So it's just, it's an incredibly wasteful process for technology to go through to develop in a completely Ill, Ill thought through direction. And then 50 years later, get slapped down and go back to the drawing board and return to the basic principle that you shouldn't have thought about these systems being autonomous in the first place. I mean, that, that we, if we follow that approach, I guarantee that the Chinese will, will and, and, and other authoritarian regimes will own the world. Because even if they're doing something that's ill thought through and brittle and dangerous, they're doing it far more rapidly and with a far clearer sense of purpose than uh, our liberal democracies in reaching and embracing their own values. Um, I think also on the, you know, this idea of people will not, um, 
use or accept these technologies that they see as as totalizing, et cetera. I think that's great when it happens. Um, I think it's damaging in, in all the great ways that Glenn pointed out, but but separate from those, often what we're seeing here and the, the issue with centralization is, well, can people opt out of these systems? And uh, I, I think we can see how if our response to the surveillance state that, that Glenn brought up is a notion of surveillance capitalism where we are creating systems that are harder and harder to opt out of. I mean, the government is not forcing me to have a Facebook or a Twitter account, yeah. right? But if more and more of my life moves online um, and it's, it's a smaller and smaller number of, of companies that dictate the terms of that life, then we aren't providing a democratic alternative regardless of, of whether or not there's, there's forcible adherence to these platforms. And kind of individualizing that responsibility, I think, can be very damaging and, and it can have instances of success, but it's not a, a productive systematic way forward in terms of dealing with those issues because they're fundamentally collective issues. And if we are collectively living in a society that uh, adheres to these principles, then it's possible for an individual to bow out, perhaps. I mean, I have, have the privilege in a lot of senses of not participating in systems I don't agree with. Many people you know, don't have that in a lot of ways. And I think it really, therefore, does have to be a collective conversation um, and a collective decision to, to invest in different types of approaches. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Look, fundamentally, you cannot reasonably face people with the choice of live in a pre-modern society or live in a democratic society. If you do, people will opt to, you know, live in a uh, authoritarian modern society. So we, we, if we want to preserve liberal democracy, we have to make it compatible with modernity. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. But just I, no disrespect to um, the um, uh, the institute you referred to and, and Nick Bostrom's work. Uh, you know, they, they raise interesting philosophical uh, um, questions, but to take them as an indicative marker or mean point of where the debate is, is, is not accurate to the, to the uh, situation here. Where, where I do agree with you is that, is, is the role of the state and intermediate institutions in creating good, beneficent, democratized, safe technology. I'm going to go away and look at the Taiwan uh, uh, example very closely to you. I think that's really exciting, but, but I, I definitely think there is a, there is a a way for bolstering state-sponsored and uh, and third space institutions, which which can play a very significant role in mediating good technology. Can I pick up on the ge geopolitical point that, in a sense, Glenn has already raised? We've said that the individual can't opt out of actually existing AI. It's a collective process. Now, some will say the state can't opt out because of competition with China. Now, there's a very arresting section, I'm trying to remember now in your paper, where you sort of say, well, the, the so-called AI arms race with China is kind of beside the point because it's an arm race premised on a form of technocracy where you're basically giving up the thing that you're meant to be fighting for, which is some kind of democratic society. But what, what do we make of that though? The fact that states too are constrained, there is a kind of competitor with different values that is also pursuing this project. Um, and therefore the room for maneuver of states is almost as constrained as the room for maneuver of individuals. Well, I, I, I don't, my, personally, I don't think the room for maneuver of states is all that constrained. And the reason is that the amount of investment that goes into the AI space is on the order of tens of billions of dollars a year. That's it. That is not an amount that is very large by the standards of most governments. It's not even that large by the standards of Microsoft, which is one reason why Divi and I are at Microsoft and interested in influencing its behavior. It's very large by the standards of most individuals. Uh, and even, you know, essentially all individuals. Um, I, I do not think we're talking about investment on the order of trillions of dollars that, that states cannot make. Um, and the, the, the fundamental problem is that the way that technology works is it's highly leveraged. Um, while you may, uh, Stephen, um, somewhat downplay the importance of folks like the FHI, um, 
they may be small voices, but they are voices with a tremendous influence on the allocation of large amounts of capital. Mm -hmm. And, and one simply cannot discount our living in a capitalist society. A anyone who does has missed the history of the last 200 years <laughs> and the way in which things um, like that start as elite seeds in the minds of a small number of people quickly become the organizing patterns of the lives of billions of people. I mean, nothing is clearer than that in the, in the history of capitalism. And um, I, I think anyone who wants to treat, uh, you know, the Sam Altman's, the Demi Hassabis's, the, uh, the um, you know, Nick Bostrom's of the world as, as side entertainment um, that is not central to, to the debate, uh, I think is missing on the, the way in which the direction of technological development goes will shape the possibilities for regulation and geopolitics in the future. But on the other hand, it doesn't take that much to do it. It does. It, it's not something that's out of the control of a UK. Maybe it's out of the control of the Netherlands. I don't know. You know. But but if you're talking about the UK, the US, the EU, these are institutions with eminent capacity to put the necessary funding, and it doesn't need to be removing all funding from AI. It just means bringing the magnitude of funding for civic participatory and democratic technologies up to the same order of magnitude of the investments that are being made in AI. It, 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 it's just having some reasonable balance between these things. And I think on the geopolitical point as well, I mean, what are we going for encountering an authoritarian tech ecosystem, right? Well, presumably we're going for building something meaningfully different from an authoritarian tech ecosystem. I'm just not of the opinion that if we're not doing that, it counts as, as, as in opposition. And I think if we are building towards a tech ecosystem that is in practice centralizing and concentrating and, and you know, dictating and, and having these negative effects, um, it's, it's not a meaningful counter argument to an authoritarian technology ecosystem. It's really building in dem actual democratic values into our technology, into its goals, into people's ability to direct it, to have choices over whether or not they use it. The privacy and surveillance questions you brought up, um, Bishop Croft, all of those things are not to me a, a good part of a counter to an authoritarian technology ecosystem. And if we are intending to stand against that and and you know, not just in the West, but also what is the impact uh, of this on post-colonial societies? And if we're kind of carrying through those power dynamics, are we are we not uh, creating a counter to this system? You know, so I, I really think we have to really think to ourselves, what are we countering and what do we have as a positive vision to offer here? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm sure you're right. And, and I think one of the tests I would apply is, is um, the way a, a society looks after children uh, in their responses to technology. So, so things like the age appropriate design code, which have been agreed here for the design of technology for the benefit of children and to preserve a digital childhood the online safety bill, which has just been published uh, in the UK. They're, 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 I think, potentially very powerful in putting forward that, that more positive vision and also translating the values which society owns across into our use of technology. Um, the issue of capitalism was raised there. I mean, it's often forgotten that the leading liberal political philosopher of the last 50 years, John Rawls, thought that liberal democratic justice properly understood was incompatible with capitalism. I'm not gonna ask you in the dying minutes of this uh, session to raise that question, but I just wanna mention one thing you say in this paper, which I thought was very interesting. You said, the current division of labor is that technologists build and then humanists, activists, lawyers, and politicians critique from outside. And you go on to call for tech companies to uh, hire, value and adequately compensate there would be critics. I assume you are would be critics, presumably who have been hired in that way and I hope valued in that way. Can you say something more about especially younger people listening who are convinced by your critique? What are the mechanisms, what are the pathways that they could best pursue this kind of vision? And is doing it for the tech company a viable pathway? 
I think Glenn is the expert here. Oh no, Divya, you're the one who's actually doing that. I'm, I'm, I'm part of the crusty older generation that's trying to make space for people like you. Well, I would say first, um, you know, I coming into this space with these convictions wasn't certain what power centers would be the right place to kind of try to affect this change. And I've noticed um, that, you know, the position that Glenn and I have in terms of being in some sense able to contribute to and direct one of uh, Microsoft, but also um, having a lot of work externally and kind of creating that balance has been a really good way to take a lot of the positives of you know what can be done from quote unquote inside the system and also try to have other positions and, and voices in creating a more holistic approach. I think it's in some ways, and, and we tried to point this out, this flowering of complementary approaches, a, a good time to try to invest in one of these things, right? I, I think some of the approaches we pointed out, the Web3, digital commons, data collaboratives, human-centered design, participative design, all of these kinds of things. I mean, if we're calling for investment in this from governments and companies, we are obviously calling for bright, young people of any age uh, to, to join these things and invest their time and talent um, in alternate directions. And I think that is probably my number one, you know, I, I am really, glad about how much these systems have been called out for their failures and for their projected you know, harms and things like that. It's now our collective project. And I think that's what we've tried to highlight here to create and point to that alternate vision. But we can't point to it if we don't create it, if we don't grow it, if we don't spend our time on it. Um, and so I would say in so much as I'm qualified to give advice, which is not at all, that that is where, where I at least would, would put my time and am putting my time. I, I think the one comment I would make is that if you are a totalizer, then the only way to deal with um, problematic existing institutions is to build something new and wipe everything away. If you are a pluralist, um, that's simply not an option available to you because the very thing that you want to empower is a diversity of institutions. And if in the process of trying to build that world, you wipe those institutions away, mm. you've completely failed in your end object, right? And so I think if you're a radical pluralist, as I think we are, the only option that you have for change is to work at the margins, to work at in the liminal space between different types of institutions and to see the possibility of growth and change and diversity precisely in the seams where those things meet. And uh, that's you know, what Divi and I have, have been attempting to do at the seams between the academy, activism, uh, the corporate world, uh, art, et cetera. Thank you so much. I'm gonna ask um, two questions from the audience, which I hope we can deal with. I think really this one, Stephen, must be for you from Ziliab. I think the recent alterations to the NHS app and the amount of information stored gives rise to concerns about how that information is handled and shared. And to Divya and Glenn from Sean, are there analogous frameworks around other sectors that you see as useful when thinking about AI? For example, safety and regulation in the media. Have any follows up? Is the paper anywhere we can read it? Question on everyone's mind, I'm sure. Uh, very, very briefly on the NHS app, um, uh, I, I, I agree. I, I think it'll make a very interesting uh, case study in terms of public trust and confidence. And I, uh, and I sense uh, it's been going in a graph uh, and is dipping because of present concerns and also as the pandemic situation thankfully changes. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not in any way responsible for it. I'd underline that. <laughs> Um, so, John, could you repeat what, what the question was about other sectors? You're on mute. Sorry about that. Are there other se sectors that offer a kind of framework that could be imported to dealing with the issues in AI? And for example, a lot of people think issues around medical ethics, for example, offer some kind of framework. Divya, do you have thoughts? 
Sure. I, I think one of the principles that we're building on here is not just other sectors, but actually other fields at large have been in some sense ignored um, through thinking about, you know, building up ethics and principles in this space, sometimes from first principles rather than, than pulling from other pieces of where this thinking has been done. And, you know, we've been thinking about how to govern ourselves and direct resources since humanity existed. So there's a huge amount of work there. Um, so specifically the NHS app, I confess, I know uh, very little about the actual process there. I think there's a huge amount that can be taken from, you know, other fields of study in terms of ethics, but even more than that, and not to be sort of a, a, a one trick pony here, but I think that is our populations that are going to be using this app being consulted? Are there good processes for that, right? Are there, is there flexibility around, um, you know, how people, is it transparent? What data is being used for? Or is that transparency accessible to people who are using the app? Is the app itself accessible to people? Um, are there responsive feedback mechanisms? Like, I think those are kind of the broader meta questions that we can take from, from lots of different fields of study that we've mentioned here in terms of, well, how do you ask those questions? How do you set up responsible, uh, responsive social organizations? How do you set up feedback loops? You know, technology, I think, can be an incredible enabler of this. Um, and, and it's those processes, um, in addition to, like, of course, safeguards from the medical side, safeguards from the privacy side, some of those things should be just instituted as regulation, but a lot of it should be responsive. And I think that's a lot of what we can also take from other fields of study. I mean, what I would say is that it's precisely that taking things across fields that we need more of. We need more politics and ethics in technology, but we need more technology in political economy. Like political economy is usually viewed as there's ancient positions, like they've been around since the beginning of time and it's just continual collision between them. And technology is viewed as something that linearly progresses. And I think we need to fix that. We need our political economies to progress and we need our technologies to be wiser. I agree. That's, I think that's an excellent note on which to end. Um, Vivia, Glenn, Stephen, thank you so much for contributing to what I think was a really fascinating and rich discussion. We haven't had an answer to the question, when will people be able to read the paper? Is anyone gonna, you know, we mustn't leave them on tenterhooks like this. Soon. Soon, okay. <laughs> thank you so much for that really excellent discussion. Thank you to everyone listening in today and good evening. Hope to see you soon again in one of our next sessions. Thank you everyone. <laughs>